Let's bow our heads for the closing prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the Sabbath day that we can come worship you, this 13th Sabbath. We ask now that we worship and glorify you and you guide us in our ideas uh, this Sabbath day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Well, we're studying this quarter in the crucible with Christ. Can anyone tell me what is a crucible? If we're going to spend three months on it. We ought to know what the word means. What is a crucible? Anyone know? 
Anyone have any done any work with jewelry? Yes, there's a picture of it. This is the, the pot, so to speak, that they put the gold in to melt it down. Now, if you were gold, it would probably be the last place you want to be. And yet, this is the place we need to be. Why do we need to be in a crucible? Why do you put gold in a crucible? For what reason? To purify it. Yes. It's not just to make it into a nice shape, which is part of it, but you have to purify it. So it starts to heat and it starts to melt down and the dross comes to the top. And then they put something in there and it collects and they pull it out. And they heat it up some more and more comes out. They heat it up some more and more comes out and go on. You think it's a pleasurable experience for the Christian to go through that? No, no it's not. Again, is it necessary? Yes. Why? Why go through all this? Why is that necessary? Why can't we just go as we are to heaven? People say, oh, accept me as I am. Well, we may not be comfortable like We're not comfortable. To go to heaven, to uh, be in heaven, we may not be comfortable. Yes, it's not comfortable being in the crucible, but it wouldn't be comfortable being in heaven the way we are. And why is that? Yes. You need to be glorified. Mm -hmm. like yeah. Like We're told that uh, in, a, um, in certain states, or certain people, if they were allowed in heaven, they would find fault in the way the angels wear their crown. Can you imagine? Not the way our virgin, but the way the angels wear the crown. Oh, look at him. He's so proud. Look. Look how he's wearing that. Oh, look how many stars he has. He must think he's big. We'd, now, we've all had experiences where we've allowed, at least for a moment, that, that feeling of jealousy or something. And hopefully as a Christian, you've stopped yourself. Hey, whoa, I, I, that is not right for me to feel that. And you put a check on it. Some people, sadly, don't put a check on it. But is it a good feeling? Imagine all eternity spending and feeling like that. Every time you see a certain person or a whole bunch of different people, you have these bad feelings come in your heart? Would that be heaven? No. So it's not an arbitrary thing that God excludes certain people from heaven. They wouldn't be happy there. We wouldn't be happy unless we allow Christ to change us. So we say, Lord, okay, if that's what it takes, do it. Put me in the fire. Purify me. And again, we have so many verses that talk about... Um, purifying us. It's a necessary thing. In fact, it is essential. We cannot live, we cannot be in heaven without it. So a crucible is this pot, so to speak, where we are melted down, where the impurities are taken out, and we are shaped into the character of Christ. And then we are fit for his service, and we're ready for heaven. Okay, our lesson, our memory text is what? This, this week. Psalm 23, the whole chapter. Well, I say the whole chapter. It's only a few verses. Uh, six or seven, how many? Six verses. And I'm sure most, if not all of you, know it by heart. So why don't we all recite it by heart? And if you don't know it by heart, don't feel ashamed to go through the Bible because how are you going to get it in your heart unless you read and recite it again and again? So Psalm 23, let's all together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Yes. Okay. I know it didn't pick up all on the microphone for those listening on, but they went through it all. And I cannot hear you when I'm speaking, and I like to hear it. So let's go through, um, let's go through line by line or even section by section. The first two words is what? The Lord. Who are we talking about in the psalm? 
Jesus, yeah. We're not talking about ourselves. We're to get our mind off of ourselves, our worries, our problems. We're talking about the Lord. The subject of Psalm 23 is the Lord and what he will do and what he has been doing and what he continues. The Lord. The creator, the maker thereof, the one who made all things. And he is what to you? The Lord is what? Shepherd. He's a shepherd. Is that what it says? What, what is a shepherd? I mean, in, in terms that, uh, uh, in earthly terms, what is a shepherd? Takes care of sheep. Takes care of sheep. Okay. Uh, what else is it? How does he take care of the sheep? Okay, what's he protecting them from? Okay, wild animals. Falling, getting lost. What else does a shepherd do for a sheep? Okay, he feeds them. Doesn't, you know, get the grain, but he brings them to places where there are green pastures. We'll look at that. Places where there's a food to eat. Okay, so he provides, he protects. Anything else? Okay. What if one gets hurt? He cares for them. Okay. He's, he's a nurse to them. Okay. All these things he is. You remember one, one of the greatest men that, that ever lived. He was a great statesman. He was a great general. He took um, the nation that he was under, which wasn't even his nation, but he became a very important position in this nation. He led this nation and his armies to win great victories over their enemies. And he was on the, in the line to become the next king of this entire nation, which at that time had become the greatest nation. And he left all that. And because of circumstances, partly by his own fault and his own mistakes, he was out in the middle of nowhere. And in God's providence, God found him a home. And now he spent some time as a shepherd, taking care of sheep. This great, great, important, like, he was the number two man in the whole nation, and he was going to become the number one man. Now he's taking care of some dumb sheep. And I mean literally dumb sheep. And he did that for how long? 40 years. 40 years. And at the end of that, he was ready to lead God's people. Now he knew what it was like to be a leader as, uh, as God. He had to take care of those sheep. He constantly had to correct them, bring them back, take them to where the water is good, take them, they want to go this way, no, this is where the grass is, and on and on and on. So one gets hurt, he has to help them and heal them. He had to fight against wolves and whatever may have been there. Maybe people would come try to steal some sheep. All this work he had to do for 40 years. Someone once said is the most expensive wolf. Think about it, those sheep. Well, here we see this as, who is the shepherd? Uh, yes, I was talking about Moses, but I mean in Psalm 23. Yes, the Lord is, does it say the Lord is the shepherd? Look carefully. My shepherd. Not his or hers or anyone else's. We're not talking about the church or the pastor or anything, though it's true for all that, it's very true. But the Lord is my shepherd. Whatever experience you're going through, even you may seem totally forsaken, look at that verse and smile. The Lord, it looks pretty bad, but this says you are my shepherd. And I'm claiming this promise, Lord, that you are my shepherd. So, Lord, lead me. I know I went down there and I shouldn't have gone down there. And I, there's these wolves are nipping at me and I got this place. I cannot climb up there. But Lord, I'm turning back to you like Jonah turned to you, and even in the belly of a well, deep under the sea. And Lord, I know you'll take care of me. Will he? What if it was totally your fault? Then he may not take so care of you, will he? Come on, tell me. He will. He, yes, he will always. As soon as you turn to him, what will he do? He'll turn to you and he'll, he'll help you. Okay, the Lord, and keep in mind, who we're talking about. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. When I was a little boy, I, I took exception of this verse. I said to my mom, no, that's not right. How can it say I don't want the Lord? 
And she didn't understand. She kept saying, no, this is right because that's what the Bible said. It doesn't mean I don't want him. It means I will not be in want. I will not be in need of anything. I'll, I'm taken care of. Now, you can't get better than that, can you? Have you ever been hungry? Yeah, I hope so. Whether on purposely fasting or because of circumstances you went through, I hope, I hope you felt hunger. And I'm not, not talking about because you're an hour late to eat. But God said he's going to take care of us. I shall not want. I will not be in want of anything. I have all my needs supplied. Is that true for us? Yes. Now, when it says wants, it doesn't mean like, um, well, I want a, a 40-foot yacht or something like this. It's not talking about this items that really we don't need, and if we had it, it would probably uh, not be good for us. Like the little child, he wants a, a motorbike, and a foolish parent gives it to him and whack into the wall, and that's it. No, 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 God is not like that. But God will take care of everything we need. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not, what? No, everything I need. And then it goes further. The next verse says, He maketh me to lie down where? Green pastures. Now, when would you lie down? What mental state would you be in to lie down? Tired, but what else? Weary, I'm looking for another word. When you're at peace, even if you're tired and weary, if you saw, if you're out someplace, suppose tomorrow, you know, we go out someplace into the wilderness or whatever, and all of a sudden we hear, Woo! and we see four or five wolves come. And oh, I'm so tired. I'm just, go I cannot deal with this now. I'm going to take a, a rest. I, I need a mental health day. Are you going to do that? No. What are you going to do? Flee, or you cannot outrun a wolf. That is a waste of time. You find a stick, you find rocks, you climb a tree, something. But you're not going to be at peace. Now, was Daniel ever surrounded by some wild animals? Yes. What were those animals? Lions. Lions. Did he have any place to run? No. Where was he? He was in a den. You know what he did that night? Besides pray, obviously. He slept. I often imagine if he didn't sleep as a pillow on one of those lions. I wonder. I wonder if he did not say, Lord, I have faithfully served you. And Lord, if it's your will for me to be eaten by lions, so be it. I have done your will. But if not, Lord, hold their mouths. And I'm going to go to sleep. And I just wonder, did he not rest on those lions? What about Nebuchadnezzar? Was he sleeping? I'm sorry, um, Artaxerxes. Was he sleeping? No. What was he doing? He was restless. All night long, he was looking through the books. Is there any way we can save Daniel? Anything we can do? Morning time, as soon as the light of dawn comes, he runs over there. Daniel, you are so faithful to God. Is, is, has God saved you? And Daniel said, yes, because you know, king, I have done no hurt. I've done no wrong. He had peace. It doesn't say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me to places and sometimes I have to be really worried because there are lions all around me. No, he maketh me to lie down. Lie down and rest, be at peace. Make me to lie down in what? Green pastures. And the problem we have is we're always looking at the other, some other green pastures and we're not realizing what we have. Like the word worry. What does worry mean? Give me a simple definition of worry. Lack of peace. Okay, lack of peace. Why? Afraid, Afraid of what? Of yeah. But worry is not, it's a present, it's a present thing we're going through because of a future problem. That's what worry is. You're worried about what might happen. If you say, oh no, this is happening right now. The lion's here right now. But is he eating you right now? No, but I'm worried he will eat me. You're all, it's always something of the future. What if? Oh, I don't have money to pay the bills. I'm worried. What are you worried for? You have a house. Yes, but I may not have it 
tomorrow. So worry is something that you're afraid of something for the future. That's what worry is. And it's blind. That's what the statement says. Worry is blind and cannot discern the future. So we're not to be worried. But all, we have a tendency to always look at those pastures on the other side and not realize where we have. One farmer, I heard this story, he had his cows, and the cows were sticking their neck out through the fence and eating the grass on the other side. So, as a good farmer, what did he do? He let them go on the other side. And after a little time, you know what he saw? They were at that same fence, sticking their neck out at the side where they just would come from. This is our nature. It's not an excuse. It's something we need to rise above. But we need to recognize it's our nature. And when we're looking out, we need to say, Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Help me to be happy and appreciate what I have. Because what I have is, is green. It doesn't always look green, but Lord, I know by faith it is green. I'm taken care of. I'm okay. Yes, I always think. We always think. Well, God is taking care of us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down. Not, in, not forcing, that's not what the word maketh means in the Old English, but he's causing, he's allowing, he's bringing me in this way to lie down in green pastures. And then what to say about the waters? Yes. The still waters. What kind of waters? We're talking about some stormy things like, this, like the disciples in, this, in the sea. Why did that happen to the disciples? Does anyone remember? You read through Desire of Ages. There they are on the boat, and this great storm comes. Why did God allow that? You remember why? Well, it says they were complaining. They were complaining all these things about God. And God said, all right, you want to complain. I'll give you something to complain about. It's right there in Desire of Ages. And so the great big storm came, and then what did they do? Oh, Lord, save us, we perish, right? What was Jesus doing? Sleeping. And they were in disbelief. I mean, they were so quickly trying to get it out, they didn't have time to think about Jesus, and all of a sudden, lightning flashed, and they could see with the light, there was Jesus. They were beside him. How can he be sleeping? We're working so hard. Master, come on, wake up, save us, we're perishing. And Jesus calmly got up, and he said to the storm, what? Peace, be still. And what happened? I, mean, I wish I could see that on video. But we will, we will. But here are these waves. Have you ever seen uh, a video or something, you know, in the deep sea? Hopefully you've not had to experience it. But great big waves coming up and down and so on. All of a sudden, just leveled out, just like that. That must have been something. And, and there was peace. They were worried. They were troubled. They were constantly complaining about, oh, look at what's going on and this and so on. And God said, all right, you want something to complain about? Here it is. Well, but God says... I have still waters for you. So he's leading me besides the still waters. And then what does it say? Uh, before I go further. Hmm? Before, Jesus talks of himself as being the good shepherd. Remember uh, John 10. He says, I am the good shepherd. And further he says, my sheep hear my voice. So he's telling us what he is. Okay, back now. He restoreth my soul. Most people, when they hear that, what do they think of? He restores my soul. What do most people think of? What's the, what comes to your mind at first with your, he's restoring your soul? Okay, forgiveness. What else? Yes. Can I have a comment, uh, yes. Jacob? Yes. Uh, uh, Psalm 23, 2, it says, He maketh me to lie down green pastures. Mm -hmm. He leadeth me to still waters. So I thought of, uh, you know, when we are in trouble, when we are hungry, God makes sure that we are provided. Mm -hmm. Green pastures is, uh, in the margin says, uh, pastures of tender grass and then waters of quietness. Mm -hmm. God makes sure that the food and water is sure when we are in need. More so, in the last days. Yeah. Yeah. 
We were told even that what he's quoting. Yes. Our bread and water will be sure. Yeah, uh -huh. amen. Okay. So someone said forgiveness, restoring my soul. What else do you think of? Make it what? Wipe the slate clean. Okay. Wipe the slate. Um, but the answers you're giving are spiritual, correct? Now, where is the word soul mean spiritual? What is a soul? Yes. He formed man from the dust of the earth. In other words, he took the nutrients, the minerals, and the, all the different nutrients, he formed man. So here you have a physical being. But as we would look at it, we would say, he's dead, right? But then he breathed in the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So when it says he restoreth my soul, he's talking physical, mental, and spiritual. That's what we are. And that's what he's restoring. Not just okay, spiritually I'm doing okay. No, he's all, he's restoring us. He's making us into his image. No, but you have to look at these verses before. He's leading me beside the still waters. He's making me to lie down in green pastures. What are we doing there? Are we just lying down and he's putting the food in our mouth and into the stomach? What are we doing? But I mean, as sheep, what do sheep do? If you, if, you, if you have your own sheep, you don't need a, a, a lawnmower. I learned that up in our place in Megalaya. What do they do all day long? They're eating, eating, eating. And when they lie down, what's happening? Yeah, in a sense. I mean, they have several stomachs, and that grass that's been chewed comes up in one, and then they're chewing the cud and it goes down in the other place. So, and they're at rest. That's when you see a, a cow or a sheep or a goat at rest, that's what they're doing. You see them chewing, it's like, where's the food? Well, it was food that they had before, that's the way God made them. Okay, so, he's restoring my soul, we're at rest, and we are recuperating. You, you all know about the eight doctors, well there's more than eight, but they're listed eight in that, but another other uh, statement, it lists about how we need to have times of just sitting down and resting. That's another thing that's very important. You can't always be on the run. You have to sit down and be meditative, as we say. You know, go through a verse in the Bible, pray to the Lord, be at calm. So we have seasons of prayer. And when I say seasons, I don't mean, okay, everyone, we're having a season of prayer. I mean in your daily life. You get up in the morning, you have a time of prayer. Uh, hopefully sometime in the day, and then in the evening before you go to sleep. This helps to, um, as sleep is for the body physical, this is for the spiritual. And it helps to get us back up. And mentally. Uh, I think it was um, the Loma Linda study where they had done, oh boy, I think it was, I don't want to say the number, because, but it was one of the biggest health studies. Um, I think it was 198,000 or something, but a very big health study. And they found out that the ones that were the most at peace, most at rest, most at feelings of goodness, were the ones that were not working during the Sabbath. They were not partaking in any secular activity. Many Adventists, Adventists in church, but then they go out and they're doing work, or they go to some place, and they're not really keeping the Sabbath. And their health suffers. We need that time. You know, if you're 49 years old and you keep in the Sabbath every seven days, physically you're like equal to a what? It takes seven years, 42-year-old. Because you had, you had, during 49 years of life, you had seven years of rest, of peace, besides your time of sleeping. Okay, he restoreth my soul. And then what does he say? He hmm? leads me. Yes. Who is leading me? The shepherd. So what do I have to fear? Nothing. Why? Because he's leading me. Who was the physical head in the, the church in the wilderness, leaving Egypt? 
Moses. But who is leading Moses? God. God. You could have said the cloud too, but and then I would ask you who is in the cloud. Um, and they complain to whom? To Moses. Why? Why not complain to God? Because they could see Moses, they couldn't see God. But Moses was following God. Do you know, if you read Patriarchs and Prophets, as they were going through, this is before they got to the Red Sea, Moses knew the land. And he knew this path where it was going. And he knew it was going nowhere. Think, keep that in your mind. He has, it's, a, it's estimated approximately two million people he had with him. Many of them were women and children. Just put aside the, the flocks, the monetary thing, all that. You're talking about helpless people. And even the men. What weapons did they have? And there they are. And Moses knew he was being led into a, a dark alley with the armies of Egypt, the greatest armies, the ones that he led, he knew that. And did he stop and say, uh-uh, Lord, I'm not going that way. Did he do that? No. He went knowing he was, in a sense, going to his own doom. But he trusted the Lord. Why? He knew the Lord. He knew the Lord was a shepherd. He knew the Lord was leading. And so, Lord, if this is where you're leading me, I don't know what you're going to do. But you're going to do it. And look at there. Here are, there are mountains on one side, cliffs. You can't go anywhere. Okay, it's, it's, he, there was led across. Um, try to picture this in front of me is the water. Okay? And he's going down this pathway. The mountains on both sides. He's hedged in. And he comes in. The mountains are there. And then it stops. So now you're all surrounded by mountains and then the water. You can't back up because the army's there. The Lord could have opened up the mountains, could he not? Yes, he could have destroyed the army, could he not? But opening up the sea, is that something you would think of? No. The Lord has a thousand ways to provide for them, of which we know not. But the sentence before it says, those who make the service and honor of God supreme. So you must say, Lord, I'm going to serve you, I'm going to honor you. That's first. Just another thought, yes. uh, Jacob. What and if you, you said, have any common questions, please raise your hand. We'll get the microphone to you. Yes. Uh, as you said, uh, both the sides, the mountains, and the, at the back, the army, mm. the enemies. In the front, the water. Mm. So the thought came to me, God will take us through to our destiny, no mm. matter what, yes. if we trust in him. Yeah. doesn't matter what circumstances are yes. there. You say, I cannot see it. Because you're a man. God can see. So he's, he's taken. He leadeth me. Uh, he brings me where? To the valley of the shadow of death. I want to read you a statement. We're talking about the crucible. I don't know if this is going to go through it this quarterly. Um, but a statement that's always been precious to me. This is from Review and Herald, 1884. It says, The time of trouble is the crucible that is to bring out Christ-like characters. Think about that. We'll go through crucibles now. And it's developing a Christ-like character, but the time of trouble, we're told. This is in the most intense form. It is designed. What does that mean? Who designed it, first of all? God, not the devil. God wants to destroy us in it, but the devil designed it to lead the people of God to renounce Satan and his temptations. Have you renounced Satan and his temptations? You say, well, to a degree, we all have. Yeah. Okay, we're all here. So to a degree we have, but have we fully renounced him? You know, every time we yield, even in the smallest thing, in a sense, it's a sympathy that we have for the devil. Mm -hmm. In a sense, we're saying, I think I would be happier if I did this. Isn't that why we do something? We do what we think is happier. You see a table with a whole bunch of food. And it's time to eat. I'm not even talking about in between meals. I'm saying it's time to eat. Which food do you choose? The one you like. Why? What do you like about it? The taste that satisfies you. Okay. You know, it's very interesting. If you would choose which foods would be good for you, regardless of the taste, your taste buds will follow. Just like a train following. And as you do that repetitively, then you look at that food and you, look, and you will choose it because I like it. You know, I 
grew up as any kid, you know, if I, if I got away with it, I'm eating between meals. And I learned about how this is wrong, and, and I learned how it's actually quite sinful, and I read these statements on it. Well, it was a real hard thing. It was a cross for me to stop eating between meals. And I failed many times. And finally, you know, I got the victory. And now, okay, right now, I had my breakfast. I had a couple hours before lunch. If you put the most delicious food before me, I have no appetite. I don't want it. It's not like, oh, no, I'm too righteous. No, I don't want it. I have no desire for it. Because the, the taste inclinations have followed. So God does that for us. But we do things because we think it makes us happy. Now, if it's a sinful thing, and we do, what are we saying? We're saying, well, I know the Lord is good, but in this way, I think that is good. You see what I'm saying? The time of trouble is designed to help us to realize and help us to root out all Amen. those things. Yes. I have one more text there, uh, Jacob. Psalm 17, 15, it says, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. Mm -hmm. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Oh. That, I like that. That's a wonderful verse. Spend time, meditate on this verse. I'm going to take this home. Um, when I awake with what? Thy likeness, like being like him, Christ likeness. Okay, so here we are, the time of trouble. Now, there's a little time of trouble. You know, the Sunday law comes, and we can't buy or sell. But we're relatively okay if we have our place in the country. We're living off the land. Um, it's a struggle, but we're doing what we can. And then comes the big time of trouble, when we have to even leave those country homes yeah. for caves, and some of us are going to be imprisoned. Um, and yet, we're going to be hungry. We're going to be thin, but our bread and water will be short. God is going to keep yes. us alive. Amen. We may be on a thread, but it will only be for a short time. Uh -huh. The little time of trouble is actually going to be longer in time. The big time of trouble is going to be shorter in time, but much more intense. But these things are, are designed to root out anything, any sympathy for the devil. You know, picture the angels. Thousands of years ago, they go back and forth to heaven. Yeah. There, Satan's meeting them. Oh, yeah, you're going to help David. You know what David did, don't you? Yeah. And the angels couldn't say anything, because it was true. And back and forth. Now, here they are at the cross. And they want to save Jesus, just like they saved him many times before. They were about to rush him off the cliff in Nazareth, and they stopped, they, they saved him. And the angels are about to rush to Jesus' safety, and a tall commanding angel says, no. You must allow this to happen. You think that would be easy for an angel? He said, I saved him before. What do you mean I'm not going to save him now? No, they, they learned authority and they learned to respect that. And here Jesus is being crucified. The loving master, the creator, the God himself. And the thoughts in their mind, I knew, I knew Lucifer was wrong. That's why I didn't follow him. I had some questions when he would bring up these accusations, but I trusted God. But my, he's murdering God. And I'm standing here watching this and there's nothing I can do. Do you think after that they had any inclination to listen to anything the devil said after that? Oh no. They just flew by him like he wasn't even there. And Satan just cut off anything left. That's what the time of trouble is going to do for us. He brings me into this valley. He's the one. God. He's leading me there. In the valley of the shadow of death. It looks pretty bad. But no matter how bad it is, who brought me there? Who? And so the next says, I will fear what? No evil. No need to be afraid. I don't care if people are shooting at you. If you're in the place God wants you to be, that's the safest place you could be. Because you could walk down the street and get hit by a car. I was, a couple of weeks ago, I'm driving down the road. And all the cars stop. And I stop. I, I came this close to hitting the car in front of me. But the guy behind me, he didn't come that close. He hit me <laughs> pretty hard. I'm using a loaner car. Um, you see, these things happen. But if you're where God wants you to be, you're safe. So he's taking care of us. Even in the valley of the shadow, I will fear no evil. For why? 
for thou art with me. You may not feel like God is with you. Does that matter? Does it matter what we feel? No. God, you said you're with me. I don't feel like it, but I, I believe it. And so, Lord, I trust in you. Will that give you peace? Yes. And so, um, Isaiah says, Thou wilt keep me in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. So if we have our mind upon God, okay, though he's bringing us there in this valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And it says, Thy rod and thy staff, they what? Comfort, Comfort me. What's the rod for and the staff? Protect. Discipline. Discipline. Sometimes to keep that wolf away, sometimes with that staff to pull that, you know, sheep up there to save him. But do you know there are circumstances where a sheep, a certain individual, will constantly go astray? What does a shepherd do? <laughs> he has to go and get him, save him back. But sometimes it happens so often, the only thing left for the shepherd to do is to take that rod and break the leg of that sheep. It's a painful thing if you love your sheep to do something like that. It's a painful thing for God to do. Uh -huh. And now what can the sheep do? Can he walk anywhere? No. How is he going to get anywhere? You've all seen the picture. He's carried over the neck of the shepherd. You've seen the picture of Jesus. God will allow things to happen to us, but we're told he will allow the least affliction necessary for our salvation. You know what that means? If you lose your leg, okay, this was necessary for me to be saved. If you lose someone you love, your own spouse or child or someone, this was necessary for my salvation. Look, I cannot see, I cannot understand it, but I trust you. And after weeks until this leg is healed, now he puts the sheep down, and what does the sheep do? Does he go, oh, I'm going to take off again? What's he do? Why? Because he's afraid of getting his leg broken? Why does he stay by the shepherd? He's so used to that loving kindness, he doesn't want to be anywhere else. You see what God does for us? So it says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. What it says in um, Revelation 3.19? Those whom I love, I rebuke and chasten. Because he loves us. Um, okay. So, then what's the next verse? That prepares the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You've had people, they put you down, they talk bad about you and so on. God has set a bountiful table of blessings for you. And they can see it, but they can do nothing about it. God is taking care of you. He's prepared the table before thee in the presence of my enemies. My cup runneth over. So, such blessings. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell where? For how long? How long is that? It's not talking about the biblical term forever until it's over. There's no over to that. Yes, forever and ever and ever. So, here in Psalm 23, these six little verses, um, but such, such full of, of so much, God is going to be with you. He's taking care of us. And our goal in the end is to be where? It's right there in the end of the chapter. To be in the house of the Lord. To be with him forever. So what does it matter, the affliction we go through? Does it matter? If we have this set aside for us. Now, you all came here this morning. How is the weather outside? Hot. How was it yesterday during the day? Hot. How was it back in January? Cold. It's kind of hard to picture yourself with frostbite fingers when you're in a hot sun. What we experience in the present is what we think of. And when we're in heaven, in fact, there's a statement in um, Testimonies, Volume 1, where Sister White spoke to, uh, I think it was Stockman and Fitch. These were two leaders during the Millerite movement. And <clears throat> they asked the Sister White and them, what was it like going through all that? And uh, I, I believe they were asking for the time of trouble and so on. And they said, you know, we tried to think of the most horrible experiences, but it was nothing compared to the glories of heaven. What does it matter what we're going through? 
God says, he who leadeth in the paths of righteousness. And I want to close with, with that, uh, that one part of the verse. What is righteousness? Simple definition. Right doing. That's simple what it means. It means doing what is right. It says, the Lord is our righteousness. He is the one. Yes, I would say that's the only right doing. But yeah, we tend to think, well, this is, this is okay for me. But, uh, but the end thereof is death, destruction. So God's leading us in the way of righteousness. What did Isaiah say? Thine ears shall hear a word behind me when you turn to the right or to the left, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Don't follow man. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. Many people, they, they don't know what to do, so they're looking to leaders to know what to do. Don't follow, whether they're on the right or the left. Many people are following politicians. We have been counseled strongly, have nothing to do with politics. It's sad I've seen many Adventists fighting over Trump or Biden. Oh, my dear, uh, you're following those men. You're in bad, bad, bad shape. So the singers can come whenever they are ready. Um, Thine ear shall hear a word behind thee when you go to the right or to the left, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Don't follow man. Follow what God said. Well, we've come to the close, but I don't see our singers yet. And that's why I'm taking advantage of the time. But listen. He's taking me in the paths of righteousness, of right doing. He will lead you to know what's right. If you don't know, he will show you. Pray and trust in God. And don't look what other people say is right. Find out here. It's the only place you're going to know for yourself. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you so much for this wonderful psalm that has so much in it, Lord. And Father, we thank you that you yourself are a shepherd. No one else, no one less. Father, lead us, guide us, help us to hear your voice and to follow you and to know in the end, Lord, whatever we may go through, that you will bring us that we may dwell in your house forever and ever. For this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.